So, hello to everyone. Well, I believe it's actually good morning to most of you. My name is Luis Suarez. I am the executive director of MIRI, the Microbial Resource Research Infrastructure. On behalf of MIRI, I would like to give you a very well welcome to this webinar, Microbial Resources for a Green, Healthy and Sustainable Future. And of course, I also want to wish you, uh, to, to thank you for uh, you have saving the time to attend to this webinar. Uh, a very special thanks is due, of course, to our speakers who have kindly accepted our invitation uh, to be part of these great programs we have uh, for today and also for tomorrow. Um, a very big thanks also to all the people who have been involved in organizing these two webinars, starting by Jean-Luc Lucas uh, from Enray, but also to Marta Abramova, uh, Telora Aibu and Francisco Rocha from uh, uh, SPI, and of course to all the people of Alpha Visa that uh, uh, will support us during the day uh, to make sure that everything runs smoothly with uh, our platform. So uh, to start with, uh, we are going to have a very short introduction about MIRI and about our strategic research and innovation agenda. I will now share my screen. I hope you all can see it now. So for those of you who are perhaps less familiar uh, with our work, uh, MIRI, uh, the Microbial Resource Research Infrastructure, is the pan-European research infrastructure uh, for the preservation, the systematic investigation, the provision, and valorization of microbial resources and uh, biodiversity. MIRI serves the bioscience and bioindustry communities by facilitating the access to a single point to the broadest range of high quality microorganisms, their derivatives, associated data and services, with a special focus on the domains of health and food, agri-food and environment and energy. By serving our users and by collaborating with other research infrastructures and by working with public authorities and policymakers, we try to contribute to the advancement of research and innovation in life sciences and biotechnology, as well as for a sustainable, competitive and resilient bioeconomy. Bottom line, we like to see ourselves as a place where biodiversity meets biotechnology and bioeconomy. The expertise and the resources from, of MIRI come primarily from our partner organizations. We are talking about 50 plus microbial domain biological resource centers, cultural collections and research institutes from 11 different countries. Altogether, they represent over 2,800 combined years of experience in dealing with microbial resources. Over 300 people uh, are working right now with MIRI from these institutions. Many of them are researchers with an H index up to 100 or more. At the core of our offer as a research infrastructure, it's our broadest catalog of microbial resources and data. Indeed, MIRI offers a single point of access to over 400,000 high-quality microbial resources and associated data, covering all the major taxonomic groups, such as archaea, bacteria, cyanobacteria, filamentous fungi, yeasts, microalgae, viruses. So this is what we have to offer uh, to our users, either from companies or from academia. Besides this catalog of microbial resources, we also offer a very comprehensive and diverse portfolio of high quality services. Uh, these services are distributed uh, uh, among 10 different categories from the most obvious ones, such as deposit, isolation, preservation and cultivation of microorganisms to services related with, for instance, omics and Malditov, which are going to be uh, discussed tomorrow in the, in the webinar. Uh, in terms of the future application of these uh, techniques and services for microbial resources research and innovation. Besides these general and uh, individual services, MIRI also offers uh, over 30 application-specific workflows of integrated services, meaning we uh, have pipelines of services coming from different of our partner organizations, and we integrate them in complete workflows in order to deliver uh, turnkey solutions to our users. So we cover the three domains of expertise of MIRI. On health and food, we offer workflows uh, 
focused on development of solutions for diagnostics for biopharmaceuticals and for microbial-based therapeutics and health promoting solutions. On the agri-food field, we offer workflows for food production processes, food safety, and agriculture. In the field of environment and energy, we offer workflows for development of bioremediation solutions, biomass valorization and bioenergy production, and finally, biomaterials and bioindustry. So if we consider altogether our microbial resources, our catalogs of services, and also our scientific expertise, we believe we can say that MIRI is a first choice partner for research and innovation in several key scientific and economic areas. What you see in this slide uh, is part of uh, our strategic research and innovation agenda for 2021-2030. It is called, as you know, Microbial Resources for a Green, Healthy and Sustainable Future. So it's the same name as this webinar, of course. Um, this strategic agenda has been published uh, about six months ago. It was the result of, of a very uh, intensive and comprehensive process. On one hand, we have run a self-diagnosis, try to map it, to identify the major strengths uh, in terms of the expertise and resources from our partner organizations. And on the other hand, we tried to identify major trends and opportunities coming from uh, the strategic uh, referentials, such as the Sustainable Development Goals and uh, Horizon Europe, to mention a few examples. And also, of course, the demand coming directly from our users, either from academia or from industry. So we did this exercise, we tried to match offer and demand, and we came up with these seven strategic areas inside our three broadest domains of expertise, health and food, agro-food, and environment and energy. So strategic area number one, it's research on pathogenic microorganisms and human and human animal infectious diseases. Number two, research and development of new biopharmaceuticals or therapeutic solutions, including antimicrobials, vaccines, fetch therapies and microbiome therapeutics for human use. Number three, research and development of new, safe, healthy and sustainable food and feed products. Number four, resources and methods for biological management of soils and crops. Number five, resources and methods for biomonitoring and or bioremediation of microbial pathogens, persistent organic pollutants and plastics in soils and waters. Number six, research and development of renewable bio-based chemicals, materials, and bioenergy sources. And number set, number seven, rescuing and preserving microbial biodiversity. So these are, these are our seven strategic areas. For each one of them, we had a small exercise. We have written down two pages. Uh, a first page uh, in which we list the alignment between the strategic area and the major global and European referentials. So you can see this in the first page for each one of the areas, how the strategic area is aligned with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, with Horizon Europe, its clusters, missions and partnerships, and also with other S3 research infrastructures. On the second page for each strategic area, we have a text, a short text, in which we mix uh, something like a, a very short uh, flash uh, uh, situation about the state of the art mixed with the future, the emerging trends and opportunities in terms of research, innovation and decade ahead, and also mixed with the kind of expertise and resources that MIRI can bring to projects in this, in this specific area. So the idea here is to have a, a very condensed and short information, uh, making it possible for you as a potential user, a researcher or a company, to immediately understand which kind of alignment and which kind of expertise MIRI can bring to your projects of research and innovation. So you can easily identify us as a possible partner for your projects. We did the same thing for the seven strategic areas, and this is mostly the content of today's webinar. So after this uh, intro introduction, we will start actually uh, with the keynote address, we will be talking about the relevance of research infrastructures uh, for the new European research area, which is, of course, a very important message that perhaps we don't have some, uh, in our mind at all times, as we are supposed to, in my opinion. Then we will move straight uh, to the strategic um, areas, starting by number one, of course, 
This is what the green uh, line means. It's a presentation of the strategic area. It will be followed by the so-called case presentation. In this case, there are two presentations. Uh, these presentations, all marked in white here, uh, uh, represent uh, work developed by MIRI partner organizations or projects in which we are involved or success stories coming from our partner organizations. After strategic area one, we will move to strategic area two. So we have the presentation of the area followed by the case presentation. At this point, we will have a precise idea, hopefully, about which kind of expertise MIRI has and can offer in terms of health research. So the only thing missing will be try to map the kind of funding opportunities that will be available, in this case, under Horizon Europe, uh, for funding collaboration projects, potential projects between you and MIRI. So this is the idea in, here in blue, is to have this mapping of funding opportunities in the work program of Horizon Europe Cluster Health uh, for the upcoming years. We will then have a period for questions and answers. So um, you are, of course, welcome and invited to, uh, uh, during the presentations, to add your questions and your comments to the chat. We will have uh, people monitoring and uh, moderating the chat at all times. Uh, Jean-Luc Cucra, uh, Marta Abramov, uh, Francisco Rocha uh, will be uh, uh, collecting your questions and your comments. And I will give them the floor uh, during this period of questions and answers to raise the questions that you have suggested the, uh, on the chat. So after that, uh, we will have a lunch pause, two hours. It will be a very long lunch, lunch pause. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, and in the afternoon, we will return uh, and uh, have the, the rest of the program. So presenting the strategic areas three to seven and the respective case presentations. In the end, uh, we will have um, uh, another presentation uh, from Horizon Europe. In this case, referring to the cluster food, bioeconomy, natural resources, agriculture and environment. Again, the idea will be to uh, uh, understand which kind of funding opportunities will be available uh, for research and innovation projects in this uh, over in these fields. So it will be a, a, a long day uh, for all of us. I hope uh, it will be uh, very useful and uh, we can end the day by uh, creating new opportunities for collaboration between MIRI and yourselves, either researchers or companies. So without uh, any further delay, uh, we will move to the first presentation. Uh, I will give the floor to Mr. Dominic Sobczak. Uh, Dominic Sobczak is the deputy head of Unit A3, uh, Research and Innovation Actors and Research Careers at DG Research and Innovation, European Commission. And he is also the executive secretary of ESFRI, the European Strategy Forum of Research Infrastructures. So, Dominic, thank you so much for having accepted our invitation. The floor is yours. Please proceed. Thank you. I think it all works. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Luis, for this very nice introduction. Can you all hear me and see me well? I would just like to confirm. Can you see me and hear me? Yes, Dominic, thank you. Ah, okay, wonderful. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to this really interesting event. Uh, I will indeed uh, give you some uh, well, I will try to give you some information about our thinking about uh, research infrastructures at European level and about uh, the policy on research infrastructures that we have been occupied with for some time already as part of the European research area. Uh, the topic that you asked me to, uh, to talk about is very broad, so I will only really scratch the surface a little bit. Now, I hope that you can see my slide in a full screen mode. Again, please confirm just to be sure that we that, that yes, you can that. see. Okay, Thank you. wonderful. Thanks a lot. So, uh, without further ado, I will go into a little bit of details uh, to provide you a context on our work on research infrastructure, as I mentioned, as part of the European research area. So, basically, uh, when you look back a little bit in history, at the beginning of the century, uh, we had a situation in which uh, on the side of research infrastructures in Europe, we had uh, some national facilities, uh, quite many of those, some uh, few international organizations, 
very well known, of course. But in overall, uh, we had a fragmented and uncoordinated landscape uh, at the European level. So when we set out to uh, implement, uh, make a dream of the European research area uh, developed in, 2000, in the year 2000 come true, uh, and this dream or this vision was to, to have a fully developed functioning and interconnected research space in Europe without barriers, where we could collaborate uh, together freely. Uh, we realized that uh, certainly one of the important components of the competitiveness of, of the research and innovation system are the research infrastructures. So uh, there was an issue with the fact that uh, the landscape of our eyes was so fragmented and there was not necessarily there were not necessarily very strong connections between the different national facilities and there were only very few shared facilities at european level or, or global level so uh, with this in mind we set out uh, under this era uh, 20 years ago uh, to develop a european research infrastructure policy uh, with a few objectives uh, all of them equally important although of different nature so first of all to pull resources uh, both financial, but also human resources, technological expertise, etc., from all across the EU, to open access uh, to research infrastructures that exist in different countries to address inequalities of access to top facilities, because of course uh, the different quality of research infrastructures existed across Europe and uh, still does, in fact, uh, to coordinate and rational and rationalize the development and use of research infrastructures, uh, because the fragmented landscape. Uh, gives you a, situ a situation in which it's easy to create duplications and you, you have a lot of ineff inefficiencies in the system. Uh, what was also important was to connect national research communities uh, better and, and thus fostering and thus foster the competitiveness in research and innovation altogether. And, uh, and also to trigger the uh, exchange of best practice, uh, develop human resources, capacity and expertise all across the EU. So uh, since then, we've come quite a long way. Uh, 20 years have passed. And uh, I think we can say that quite proudly that we have, uh, we have developed a relatively well in interconnected European research infrastructure landscape by now. So we have, uh, of course, pan-European research infrastructures incubated through the S3 roadmap. And MIRI is one of the very good examples on that, uh, of that, with uh, uh, six uh, thematic areas and there are, there, the, the landscape is now quite rich. We have developed the European Research Infrastructure Consortium, which is a, a dedicated legal framework for the setup of research infrastructures. And again, MIRI is an, is an ERIC as well. We have 22 ERICs by now. We have also uh, European RI networks, a truly European RI networks that were incubated through our framework program. Uh, under Horizon 2020, just to give you a flavor, we have uh, supported around 90 of those networks and 37,000 researchers uh, to get access to the top facilities in Europe. And we also, of course, have a, a, a richer than 20 years ago a landscape of national facilities and laboratories of different sizes, uh, very often uh, right now also incubated through national roadmaps where we, uh, where we have a growing alignment of methodology and also priorities with what we do at European level. Uh, and, and these national facilities are, of course, very often nodes of European RIs, and they have a different combination of funding from national and EU sources. Uh, so when we look at this evolution at the level of, of, of pan-European research infrastructures through the S3 roadmap, uh, we can easily see, and I will not go into great details of these graphs, but you, first of all, on the, on the left graph, you can see uh, the total number of RIs on the roadmap, it started with 35 uh, projects that were envisaged to be important at that time. Uh, we now, with the 2021 roadmap that will be launched publicly on the 7th of December, and I warmly invite you to that event, uh, online event, unfortunately only, due to the current sanitary situation, we have uh, 63 research infrastructures on the roadmap, and we have continued our ambition to have new priorities throughout the years. Uh, as you see, also the investment uh, needs and the investment goals for research infrastructures has been constantly growing from a bit less than 14 billion euro in 2006 to almost 25 billion euro for the roadmap of 2021. Of course, spanning the investment needs throughout the entire life cycle of the, of the research infrastructures and that are the roadmap. Some of these investments have obviously already been made uh, in the last uh, 10 years primarily, 
but still a lot of these investments will need to be made in the coming years. What we also observe is that thanks to all this development, uh, once the research infrastructures are established, they, all, they also create increasing inclusiveness in the European research area. So we have more and more countries joining the research infrastructures and thus increasing their capacity. This is an overview of the landscape. I will definitely not go into the details of that, but here you can see how rich the landscape is. And uh, now referring to the topic uh, a bit closer of the relevance for, for, for societal challenges also, and for different other prior policy priorities that we have in, that we have in Europe, uh, we can see that uh, the pan-European research infrastructures, uh, at least at the S3 level, they are, uh, they are covering many fields of science. Uh, we have broad areas identified that by the S3 roadmap, energy, environment, health and food, physical sciences and engineering, social and cultural innovation, and also digital research infrastructures. And all of them are of great relevance for many of the, of the challenges that we have and, and for uh, many of the policies that we are trying to develop right now. Uh, and again, here, this, uh, this includes already the 2021 roadmap, so you will see MIRI as a new landmark and uh, on the right hand side and you will see the projects that will enter the roadmap uh, this year now when we were setting out to develop or uh, to, to to start our thinking on the new european research area so after 20 years how do we need to where do we need to focus to make our research innovation system more effective and more efficient and more impactful as well at the level of s3 we also uh, had a reflection uh, process, which took quite quite a long time, to see what uh, where we wh what we have managed to achieve in research infrastructures uh, in that time, and what uh, should be our focus for the coming years. Uh, the result of that reflection was the publication of the S3 white paper, "Making Science Happen: A New Ambition for Research Infrastructures in the European Research Area." And there, we uh, first of all observed uh, a couple of or maybe obvious uh, things. First of all, uh, that research and innovation are indeed essential for addressing challenges that lie ahead of Europe. And research infrastructures, as we knew also 20 years earlier, uh, are really the key for the competitiveness of the, of the science that we have in Europe. So uh, at the same time, uh, the coordination of investments that we have managed to achieve uh, in research infrastructures was really, uh, has been really up until now is and will continue to be, I'm sure, uh, one of the key achievements of the era. So we do have a well-developed, comprehensive and operational, more and more operational, really providing services to scientists, landscape of research infrastructures. So uh, a renewed vision for our eyes, uh, therefore, is, will also, is also needed in the renewed European research area. And we wanted to focus on excellence, impact and also effective governance for research infrastructures in Europe. Now, uh, this, uh, division, this vision has been developed into, into uh, a narrative that encompasses uh, five dimensions where, the, where, where action is needed uh, to realize that general vision of a healthy and interconnected research infrastructure system, uh, ecosystem in, in Europe. And these uh, touch upon the excellence of research infrastructures themselves uh, and the excellence of research. Uh, they touch upon the, the usefulness and the relevance of our eyes for the innovation that we need in order to uh, help drive the economic growth, social and environmental transitions, as well as place-based innovation. We did recognize at the same time that uh, the, the education dimension of research infrastructures is very important. They are very often closely connected with higher education institutions or even hosted by them. They are an important uh, place where the new generation of researchers uh, can be educated and trained. Uh, we also need a growing, uh, alignment of the work that we do on research infrastructures with the policies, with the broader context of policies for research and innovation, but also other sectoral policies. And also we recognize the very important potential of exploiting the data science and, uh, and exploiting also the, the expertise that we have on data among the RIs for the European Open Science Cloud, but also for the broader use uh, of data uh, for research and for policy in Europe. So uh, we've then set out, of course, this was part of the, ref of the much broader reflection at the European level on how to progress with the European research area. 
the, the Commission uh, in 2020 has published a communication outlining the vision for the era, where we wanted uh, research and innovation to really support the economic, social, and environmental transitions. This was the, the main focus, uh, with the four key priorities on prioritizing investments and reforms, improving access to excellence, uh, better translating research and innovation results into the economy, and also to deepen, to deepen the European research area. And now when you think about research infrastructures and uh, every, all the work that we have done around, around them and everything that we managed to achieve, you will very easily see that research infrastructures are actually contributing very strongly and have the potential in the future to contribute very strongly to all four of these dimensions, to all four of these key priorities of the European research area. Now, uh, to summarize actually the move, at least from the point of view of the research infrastructure policy from the European research area of 2000 to the European research area of 2021, uh, I think it is useful to have uh, just a, big, a little bit of an overview of how the policy will be changing because of what we managed to, uh, to, to, to do in the meantime. So in 2000, we were focusing on pulling uh, the resources that existed uh, with the help of the ERIC framework coordination of the work, uh, opening access to ARISE, uh, stimulating connections between facilities, exchanging best practices and connecting research communities. With the era of 2021, now a lot of that has been done, what we set out to do 20 years earlier. And now uh, we need a slightly different focus and, uh, and an adaptation of our policy to the current situation and, uh, and the evolving and maturing landscape of research infrastructures in Europe. So the focus now would be more on research infrastructure sustainability, on the consolidation of the landscape itself, to have the research infrastructures, infrastructures better collaborate with each other, strengthening the services that research infrastructures provide uh, for science, but also in the broader context, broadening access and making it more, in, more inclusive, uh, as well as focusing on innovation and technology development and increasing the overall impact of uh, the research infrastructures at European level. So uh, I'm slowly getting to the end now. Uh, you also asked me to very briefly speak about the relevance for Horizon Europe. And uh, I think that the program of, of today will explore the, the, these impacts that uh, MIRI can have. Uh, but I think it's all relevant also for all the other research, all the other research infrastructures on the S3 roadmap, but also at national level. They are uh, since, since this is where science happens. Uh, the, the research infrastructure is relevant for all the thematic areas, for all the uh, challenges that we want to address with Horizon Europe. And there, of course, uh, RIs can be used for research under the European Research Council and also for exchanges of Marie Skłodowska theory. We have some RIs that are very active there. We, of course, also have a research infrastructures program where we support directly research infrastructures in Europe through, uh, through Horizon Europe. But in particular, I would like to focus on Pillar 2, where we have all the major challenges related to health, culture and creativity, security, uh, industry, uh, climate change, etc., and food biotechnology, uh, natural resources, agriculture. So on the, I think that we need to explore how uh, different research infrastructures that we have in Europe can actually more directly contribute to all these areas and can more directly engage with research which is ongoing and which is funded, uh, in particular under Pillar 2. And now uh, I would like to draw your attention to, to something that, that you, I'm sure, very well know about, uh, which are the Horizon Europe missions. As you may know, uh, after a lot of work and a lot of discussions, uh, we, the Commission adopted a communication on missions earlier this year, uh, where we identify five missions with concrete deliverables uh, that we would like to be uh, to help solve uh, some of the key societal challenges by 2030. Uh, these include adaptation to climate change, where we would like to support at least 150 European regions and communities to become climate resilient. We have uh, uh, a mission in cancer, where we would like to work with Europe's Beacon Cancer Plan to improve the lives of more than 3 million people through prevention, cure, and solutions to live longer and better. Uh, we have a mission on restoring our oceans and waters. Uh, we also have a mission on uh, achieving uh, or establish, well, not establishing, but transforming 100 cities in Europe to be climate neutral and smart. 
uh, and all this, of course, by, by 2030. This is the plan. And then the final mission, a soil deal for Europe, where we would like to establish 100 living labs and lighthouses to lead the transition towards healthy soils. And again, here, I think that uh, at the European level, in the S3 roadmap, but also uh, at national level, we have research infrastructures, many of them, that can very easily contribute to each of these missions. And uh, one of the challenges, I think, in the coming months already would be to uh, support research infrastructures, stimulate different research infrastructures, to connect to the communities at European and national level that are developing and forming right now around these five missions. So thank you very much for those for your attention. As I said, I only scratched the surface, uh, and I wish you a great uh, seminar throughout the day. Thank you so much, Dominic, for this very clear and comprehensive presentation. Um, I guess there's a, a small room for questions because you were uh, so clear. But anyway, uh, any of the colleagues moderating the chat, uh, are there any questions for Mr. Sobchak? Hello, Luis, Mr. Sorsak. Hello, good morning. This is Francisco. Yes, we actually have received a question from uh, Christina, one of our colleagues, um, regarding the expertise in the research infrastructure services that should be more oriented to support academia or industry. Is there any possible competition between the research infrastructures and private companies in providing services? I don't think really there is competition. Uh, we look at, and you know, I, I think that many of the many of the research infrastructures provide services that uh, are not or even cannot be or are, are very difficult to be provided by by private companies. Now, of course, we have also uh, the type of facilities that we call technology infrastructures that form a little bit a continuum with research infrastructures and sometimes overlap a little bit. Uh, along the uh, along the technology readiness levels in the value chain of, of research and innovation where there are links but i don't think we should consider this as a competition uh, we should reinforce the work that the way that uh, research infrastructures engage with industry and can serve industry uh, but i doubt they would be really competing okay are there any other questions Francisco? No more questions so far, Luis. Thank you. Okay, so if not, uh, thank you so much, Dominic, for your uh, great presentation. And of course, thank you so much for having accepted this invitation. It was a very positive sign from our side, from all research infrastructures, to have uh, you, as usual, as much involved with, with our work. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Thank you very much, Luis, for the invitation. It was a pleasure, and I wish you once again a really fruitful day. Okay, thank you. So we will now proceed to the next presentation. Uh, I will now give the floor to uh, Dr. Sylvain Brice. Uh, Sylvain is the director of the Biological Resource Center of Institut Pasteur. He is also director uh, at the research unit Biodiversity and Epidemiology of Bacterial Pathogens. And besides that, he is also an acting member of MIRI's Interim National Coordinators Forum. Uh, Sylvain will be presenting uh, the MIRI strategic area number one, so research on pathogenic microorganisms and human and human animal infectious diseases. Sylvain, the floor is yours. Thank you. I believe we are having some problems with getting Sylvain connected. Hello. Oh, there you are. Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry. There was some um, time uh, clock uh, running around, but nothing happened. So do you hear me well? Perfectly, Sylvain. Thank you. Wonderful. I will share my screen. Uh, 
Right. So do you see this, the, the slide now? Perfectly, please go ahead. Wonderful. So thank you very much. Uh, um, I'm Sylvain Brice. I'm working at Institut Pasteur in, in Paris uh, at a structure called the CRBIP, which is the Center for Biological Resources in uh, Institut Pasteur. And so I'm very happy to have this opportunity to introduce uh, the strategic area one uh, and the implication of MIRI in this strategic area, which is entitled uh, Research on Pathogenic Microorganisms and human or human animal infectious diseases. So first off, I would like to put uh, into context uh, this strategic area and uh, remind the audience uh, about the alignment of this strategic area with uh, the, the global and European strategic agendas. So in particular, we are obviously aligned, for example, with the UN Sustainable Development Goals 3 and 6. We are um, also uh, connected to uh, Horizon Europe clusters, in particular the health cluster. Um, the Climate Resilient Europe uh, mission is also uh, very, uh, very connected with, with what we are doing. And also uh, there are a number of partnerships uh, at the European level where we uh, do have a role to play. Um, just to mention for health, for example, the EU Africa Global Health or the Innovative Health Initiative, etc. You can, you can read by yourself, obviously, the, the details. And we are also uh, quite connected and uh, will have collaborations with uh, other research infrastructures. In particular, for example, we are already connect, co collaborating uh, with, with Erinia or Elixir. Um, so in the, in, the, in the coming minutes, I would like to um, um, remember, remind you how uh, Miri is involved in this uh, um, issue of uh, meeting the challenge of emerging pathogens. Obviously, Miri has main uh, missions, I would say, um, has to preserve and distribute relevant strains, to provide services and expertise, and also to provide access to research facilities and equipment. And uh, I will really focus on uh, um, the issue of pathogens today. Just to remind you, the burden of infectious disease is, is quite uh, considerable. Um, here you see on the left the uh, reasons why people die every year and uh, lower respiratory infections as well as diarrheal diseases uh, count as the main causes of death. Uh, it's estimated that 15% of all world deaths due to infectious diseases. And you can see the, the, the other numbers here. And obviously a considerable economic burden of the eight major infectious diseases, which amounts to 3 trillion uh, US dollars, for example. That's, that's a considerable aspect. Um, if we, if we go into the details of what types of diseases uh, are involved, um, diarrheal diseases are really the top the top one in terms of uh, types of disease. Uh, and this is important because this involves the foodborne pathogens and also the waterborne pathogens. Um, another type of uh, pathogen that is quite important to consider is the zoonotic pathogens. Uh, you can see here some numbers, and in particular, 60% of existing human infectious diseases are zoonotic. So it's quite important to work in the One Health uh, uh, perspective as well uh, when we consider what we are doing. Finally, I would like to uh, just mention um, that the world has changed since <laughs> since the, the last century, and uh, we are in a very very interconnected world. We know we know that very well, but uh, it's important to keep in mind uh, the speed at which new diseases emerge is accelerating, and uh, no need to mention COVID uh, today. Obviously, on the right here you see a number of recently emerged uh, novel diseases such as SARS or uh, swine flu, MERS, COVID. And what, what is striking is that uh, most of these are viruses. And so the, the viral di dimension of MIRI is quite important. And um, also um, there are a number of bacterial diseases that have emerged, in particular cholera. We could also mention uh, plague, for example. And so bacterial, bacterial strain and, and collections are an important component of MIRI. Um, perhaps also significantly uh, relevant is the, the other pandemic, which is kind of hidden because it's kind of slow and progressive, 
but we should definitely not forget about it. It's the hidden epidemic of antimicrobial resistance. Um, as you know, uh, pathogens emerge that are almost untreatable, and um, even when they are treatable, they are treatable by uh, more expensive drugs, which induces uh, extended lengths of stays in the hospitals, for example, and additional costs to the, to the healthcare system. So that's a very, very important issue, both in terms of health and in terms of economics. Um, this is the, the, the famous O'Neill report, uh, which estimated a number of uh, metrics uh, re regarding the impact of antimicrobial resistance. And uh, it was estimated, and this has been debated since, but it was estimated that uh, in, in 2050, 10 million people could die every year on, uh, due to antimicrobial resistance. So um, all this brings us to uh, the causes of these diseases. And um, we, the first thing I would like to highlight is that uh, bacterial pathogens are quite diverse. Uh, we need to consider viruses, bacteria, but also parasites and, and perhaps archaea in some cases. Um, and each of these parasites or uh, microbes is also uh, highly diverse. Uh, this cartoon shows you the classical uh, phylogenetic structure of the, of the tree of life. And uh, within species, you also have a lot of diversity. So that's something that is often overlooked but is very important in what we are doing in the MIRI uh, strategic area one, which is to consider not only representative, representative strains of each species, but also uh, the diversity within, within species, uh, down to the individual isolates sometimes. So the, uh, the need for microbial resource centers to preserve and distribute relevant strains is, is quite important. And, um, so this is the same slide as uh, I presented pre previously, just to, to remember and to may maybe provide a few examples now uh, on how we meet the challenge of emerging pathogens. So the first thing I wanted to highlight is uh, that microbial biological resource centers are quite critical for diagnostic development and implementation. We have seen that in the case, in the recent example of COVID, but uh, obviously that's, that's the case for many emerging diseases. Um, Microbial biological resource centers contribute to the rapid distribution of reference materials, which are quite critical in this case to, for laboratories to set up diagnostics, but also to implement them, to, to get control, um, uh, for example, non-target strains. Uh, sequence data comparisons are quite important also to, to define uh, the diagnostic SNPs, for example, which will be used as a basis for diagnostics. And obviously the reference materials are also quite important for external quality assessment programs, for example. So, as an example, um, MIRI partners are involved in a so-called uh, CARE project within the One Health uh, European Joint Program uh, instrument. And um, in, this, in this project, um, uh, new proficiency testing schemes uh, uh, are being developed, um, in particular to evaluate the capacity to manage foodborne problems in, in this consortium and reference materials for microbiological analysis on zoonotic pathogens are being constituted and distributed across um, different collections. In, um, and we hope that uh, these, these reference materials will be integrated in, into the MIRI partners, uh, uh, biological resource centers to become a kind of a sustainable resource for the community. Uh, another example that I wanted to highlight is the uh, role for microbial biological resource centers um, uh, in developing novel therapeutics and vaccines. So for these types of endeavors, we need rapid distribution of reference materials. Uh, there is a need to catalog antigenic diversity to target, um, so that the, the vaccines target the, the main, uh, the main uh, clonal lineages or uh, antigenic uh, variants of the pathogens. Obviously, the search for biosynthetic gene clusters uh, is something that uh, microbial biological resource centers can also promote by providing uh, reference materials and genomic sequences as, and all the expertise that, that comes around it. And this will be probably um, developed further in the future uh, presentations. Also, innovative culture and expression methods can be developed. Uh, when I say expression, I mean gene expression methods, because uh, as you know, the bio biosynthetic gene clusters are not always expressed, and it's important to develop uh, knowledge and, and, and research in this area as well, to, to discover novel bioproducts. And uh, we can also 
mention mechanisms of actions and um, of, of the new therapeutics, for example, which, which needs to be investigated in the in the biology in, in, in the microbial strains that are that can be hosted in the microbial uh, biological resource centers. So um, further examples. Um, Historical strains are very important to store, and this is one of the important and I would say traditional roles of the microbiological resource centers um, that, that allows to answer a number of questions, such as, for example, um, are the strains that circulate today uh, the same strains as uh, in a few decades ago, for example? And how did resistance emerge in, in these particular sublineages that are now highly problematic in medicine? And also our populations escaping vaccines. You can you can think of uh, SARS-CoV-2, obviously, but also um, in bacteria, for example, uh, the pneumococcus. Um, so one one example here comes from uh, the Pasteur um, microbiological um, groups who have studied um, together with a reference center for salmonellosis in Pasteur the emergence of a particular multidrug resistant clone called Kentucky. And uh, here I just want to highlight that the microbiological resource center were uh, very important because they provided old strains which enabled to reconstruct the history of development of this sublineage and the, in the history of acquisition of particular antimicrobial resistance genes and its dissemination across uh, the world. And so uh, in this case, uh, we, we, we see that um, antimicrobial resistance emerged as a gradual effect of acquisition of either you know, mobile genetic elements or mutations, for example, uh, in the um, proteins that uh, tar are targeted by the quinolone um, antimicrobial agents. So um, this is one example, and there are plenty of examples uh, on how microbiological resource centers are useful to reconstruct the history of emergence of novel pathogens. Another very important aspect of microbial, uh, microbiological resource centers is obviously the um, uh, nomenclature of strains. And also here, uh, fresh on our mind, is the example of the Pongo nomenclature and uh, the simplified nomenclature by WHO, which, which calls the sublineages Delta or Alpha, for example. Um, these are very, very important uh, activities that are made in the background and where uh, our uh, infrastructure, MIRI, can, can really play a role in, due to its expertise in, in genomics, for example, in bioinformatics, and due to the expertise in biodiversity in general. Uh, and this afternoon, uh, or tomorrow afternoon, uh, uh, Federica Palma from, from our group will also uh, present in more detail um, the approach that we use for uh, strain taxonomy at the level of the genomic data uh, for bacterial pathogens. So perhaps one slide to discuss for future challenges, which, which is, to my opinion, quite interesting to, dis to discuss. We need to further develop technologies for characterization, preservation, and, and databasing. Um, host pathogen interactions also can, uh, can be studied further, um, thanks to the involvement of uh, MIRI partners. Uh, there is the issue of healthy microbiota, which is uh, very, very important nowadays in medicine and, uh, and biotechnology. Uh, culturomics is also an important uh, aspect because, as you know, many of the existing biodiversity of, of, uh, of bacteria, for example, cannot be cultured nowadays. And uh, our centers can really play a role in there due to their expertise and resources. And also, uh, I would like to raise the, the, the question, perhaps for the discussion, whether the microbi microbiological biological resource centers can um, keep up with emergence. Because as I have shown you uh, earlier, uh, emergence is quite fast. It's, it's a multi-pathogen uh, parallel emergence. And so it's, a, to my opinion, a quite important challenge for uh, biological resource centers to acquire, characterize, and distribute in, um, in a timely fashion the novel strains that emerge uh, all the time in, uh, across the world. So that's a very important area for future uh, discussions and developments for MIRI. And with that, I will, uh, I will stop here and thank you for, for listening. Thank you very much, Silva. The timing is perfect. 
So we will move to the case presentations. In first place, uh, we will have uh, Dr. Raquel Hurtado Ortiz. She is uh, the executive and administrative head of the National Collection of Cultures of Microorganisms as Antifi Pasteur. And she's also an acting member of MIRI's Interim National Coordinators Forum. Uh, Raquel will be talking to us about the participation of MIRI on the Eurasian Europe project, Isido. Raquel, please, the floor is yours. Yes, hello everyone. I hope uh, you hear me well. Perfectly, yes. Raquel. Thank okay, <laughs> thank you very much. And, and if you see my presentation also, yeah, it's okay. So yeah, I would like to thank uh, organizers for inviting me to this uh, to this webinar. Um, I will uh, I will present the Isidor project in which Miri is uh, is participating. So and I uh, I have only some minutes, so I will give you a, a quick overview about this about this project. So how this story started? Uh, so in April 2021. The European Commission uh, launched an emergency uh, request for expressions of interest for projects focused on fight uh, coronavirus <coughs> and to contribute to prevent, mitigate and respond the impact of coronavirus variants. So this initiative had an investment of uh, 123 million uh, euros. And this program included uh, four topics. Uh, it was in the fourth topic that the Isidore proposal was uh, submitted. And in total, uh, 11 projects were accepted for funding. For, for the topic, for example, of fair and open data sharing in support to European preparedness for COVID-19, it was the, the, COVID, the by COVID project that was also accepted. And uh, Paolo Romano will talk uh, about this later on. Uh, in the fourth topic, uh, only the Isidore uh, project was accepted, uh, accepted for funding. And the name of Isidore, you, you have uh, here the meaning, Integrated Services for Infectious Diseases Outbreak uh, Research. And it is uh, coordinated by the uh, ERINA Research Infrastructure. So there are uh, 17 uh, main participants. Here you can uh, you can see the, the list of all the, the, uh, these main uh, participants, and uh, representing Miri uh, is the Institute Pasteur. But as you can see here, the Institute Pasteur, other teams of Institute Pasteur are also uh, representing other research infrastructures, for example, such as such as Infravec or other European projects such as uh, Sonar Sonar Global. But in our case, is the Biological Research Center of Institute Pasteur uh, that is representing uh, MIRI. And I, I, however, I have to highlight that the extended consortium of this project includes uh, 156 organizations, and most of them are participating as uh, service providers. And here you can hit the map of the, of the Isidore's access providers in Europe, but also in other countries uh, outside uh, Europe. So the Isidore project is a three year long project. It has a total budget of uh, 21 million euros. And the budget is organized in this manner. So more or less 50% uh, uh, focus on service provision. I mean, uh, the transnational, transnational access, 30% uh, for joint research activities and 20% for manage, uh, project management and other activities. And the overall pro, uh, objectives of Isidore uh, are focused to fighting the rise of SARS-CoV-2 variants, but also any other, uh, any other epidemic prone pathogen. And that's why Miri was invited to, to participate in this, uh, in this project, because it's not restricted to, to SARS-CoV-2, or other diseases uh, caused uh, by viruses caused by viruses, but uh, other it, it includes also any other epidemic prone uh, pathogens. So the project was structured uh, and coordinated according to, according to a uh, research and development pathway, which is represented here in this uh, diagram. It uh, it identifies, for example, key steps towards pathogen identification, vector characterization, 
uh, identification of uh, molecular targets, uh, diagnostic vaccine and drug development, uh, but also, for example, some uh, social aspects of emergence and uh, implementation of countermeasures. Measure, all these, uh, all these together, uh, will address the overall pro uh, objectives of Isidor. The project is organized in uh, 16 uh, work packages. The first six work packages uh, are dedicated to transversal activities that structure and uh, coordinate uh, the contributions of all the research infrastructures that uh, will collaborate, that are collaborating. And the other 10 work packages, I mean, the, from the work package 7 to work package 16, um, are entirely dedicated to service provision, I mean, uh, transnational access. So focus in our participation representing MIRI, as I already mentioned, uh, it is represented by the Biological Resource Center of, of Institute Pasteur. And we are involved in uh, the work package 2, with that, with, uh, which address the coordination uh, of scientific activities. In the work package five, that is focused on communication and outreach activities. And in the work package seven, about reference uh, materials. And uh, talking about the services that we included, uh, well, those services are uh, focused in the event of bacterial emergencies. So, for example, genome-wide an analysis and characterization, identification of clusters of concern and emerging clones, and access to curated nomenclature reference databases. So, well, uh, this is all from my part, and I would like to thank you, and I give the floor to Paolo Romano, that uh, we will talk about uh, the other project, the BICOVID project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raquel. Uh, indeed, we are giving the floor now to Dr. Paolo Romano. Paolo is a researcher at uh, Ospitale Policlinico San Martino in Italy. He is the president of the scientific committee at the Joint Research Unit MIRI Italy, so Italy's uh, national node of MIRI, and is also an acting member of MIRI International Coordinators Forum. As Raquel mentioned, Paolo will be presenting the by COVID project in which MIRI also participates. So, Paolo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Many thanks, Luis. Many thanks for your invitation to present here in this context of the BICOVID project. Oops, sorry. Um, BICOVID project, as has been already somehow mentioned by uh, Raquel, is not a, a, a separated event. It is included in the ERA versus Corona action plan which started, started already in January 2020 with uh, the uh, implementation of versatile emerging infection disease observatory VIO. And uh, since then it had many other occasions and situations and the implementation of uh, systems that support uh, the reaction plan. Uh, it was of special interest the establishment of the COVID-19 data platform uh, in the context of the OSC Life uh, existing EU project in April 2020. And finally, in March, uh, the, um, the call for fair and open data sharing uh, in March 2021, sorry, uh, the call for uh, fair and open data sharing in support of European preparedness for COVID-19 and other infectious diseases was uh, funded launched and finally the bicodrid project started in uh, october 2021 so uh, the key facts reports that uh, the total budget is of 20 um, uh, sorry uh, 12 millions involving 33 organizations as you can see the duration of the project is uh, 36 months and there are many research infrastructures which are involved in the project which essentially is a ICT project. So um, oriented to um, uh, informatic issues. Of course, um, the MIRI, Eric, has not yet been uh, started, so it is not included, but we have been invited to participate in the project anyway. 
The bi-COVID objective may be summarized in four main, main uh, uh, points. The first is related to research, the ob objective of enabling storage, sharing, access and processing of research data from outbreak research, which uh, uh, this uh, objective is somehow an extension of the existing COVID-19 data platform, which already provide access to this information for the main databases of uh, biological interest. The other objective is related to health, so mobilize and expose viral and human infection diseases from uh, disease data from national centers. Uh, one main issue or point of the project is uh, the adoption of fair data and metadata for SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, uh, which is, uh, let's say, uh, the main technology or methodology better that is used to uh, try to take uh, the, the great benefits from the world uh, uh, information that is provided by a lot of different information systems. And finally, the analysis of this data. Uh, so the project aimed to develop digital tools and data analytics for outbreak, outbreak uh, preparedness. And uh, with a special uh, attention to tracking genome, uh, genomic variations. Sorry, I moved too far. This is uh, somehow summarized in this slide where you can see many providers of information uh, on from the health uh, systems, but also from universities and research centers, which provide a lot of information that must be uh, moved, but also especially connected and standardized. Only through this uh, uh, path of connection and standardization of the information, we can uh, uh, hope to have the ability to expose a coherent uh, ecosystem of information and be able to analyze this information by a specific and devoted uh, uh, computer to software tools. Uh, the organization of the project uh, is uh, uh, essentially uh, re reflecting uh, the concept of mobilizing, connecting, standardizing, and uh, exposing and analyzing data. So the first two work packages, I hope you can see well this, uh, this slide. Uh, I got the image from a, another presentation. I could not change it. Um, the first two work packages, work package one and work package two, essentially relates to uh, access and sharing of the information, which is provided in many different contexts. The work package three is related to connected and standardizing the information in an integrated uh, platform. And the finally, work package four is related to the development of tools for analysis of this information. All the other work packages are supporting this activity. Of special interest is work package five, which is aimed to create and test use cases in order to demonstrate the effective quality of results that can be obtained by this approach. Uh, the, United, uh, the European Union had some expectations on this project and as already uh, Raquel has uh, presented, um, by COVID is not uh, a standalone uh, project, it is uh, included in a coherent set of projects and platforms. Uh, it is aimed to closely collaborate with Isidore, and but also to integrate into the European Open Science Cloud <clears throat> and to uh, the European Health Data Space, which is being developed. Which is the role of MIRI in this context? As I already said, uh, the, the project is mainly um, related to uh, uh, computer science and uh, development of software. So it is not uh, the main uh, field of interest for me, but at the same time, we were able to be involved 
uh, for our explicit, um, special competencies in two of work packages of the system. For work package two, which is aimed to assessing heterogeneous data across domains, there is a, uh, an involvement of our uh, of my institute, the Hospital San Martino, for uh, the analysis of non-patient related data sources. And this uh, will be uh, likely the main uh, point of connection with Isidore. In uh, World Package 6, which is the uh, World Package devoted to uh, engagement and build capacity uh, with uh, other stakeholders at national and international uh, levels, um, two uh, partners which are uh, zooprophylactic institutes in Italy have been involved for the uh, exchange of knowledge with uh, surveillance systems for pathogens and uh, for uh, the engagement of uh, intergovernment uh, policy makers and funders, especially in the veterinary domain. This is all from me. Uh, I will, I will of course take uh, questions during the question and discussion session. And we have, if you are interested in more information, you can contact me by email. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paolo, for your presentation. Um, I believe we have a couple of minutes left for any questions, either for Sylvain or Raquel or Paolo. Uh, Francisco, I believe there is at least one question, perhaps for Sylvain. Is that right? That is uh, correct, uh, Luis. So uh, we have one question uh, saying the following. MBRC is also important to collect and preserve beneficial strains to develop future I am afraid that we had some issues during the presentation. I only realized Hello. now that I'm back to the session. Can Sorry, you tell Paolo? me if uh, my presentation was okay? Yes, perfect. It was perfect. Thank you. Silva, I will I will uh, say the question again. So MBRC is also important to collect and preserve beneficial strains to develop future clinical applications, live biotherapeutics products. IP could be an issue. What do you think about this? This is the question we received. IP, you mean intellectual property? On... I believe so, yes. Um... I, I don't know. It's, it's a very broad question here. Uh, IP, um, in principle, for example, in our collection of bacterial strains at Pasteur, um, we do not, uh, I mean, typically, uh, biological materials that are deposited in our, in our resource centers um, are deposited with the purpose of openness, right? So there is, in principle, um, access to these resources without any uh, any restriction um, pending, you know, Nagoya and other, other frameworks. So, but the IP, I think the IP on uh, innovations is, is not treated by the microbiological resource center itself, but upstream or downstream. But maybe I, I, I misunderstood the question. Uh, we have if there one is, minute left if you want to, to give the, the floor to the person who asked this question. Please, I, 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 I would do that. Uh, Lucille uh, Owobi, I, I believe I'm pronouncing it correct. If you want to intervene and speak, I think this is a, a good time to do so. And if not, we open also the floor to any other questions. Okay, I guess if we don't have uh, any question or Lucille is not able to connect and ask the question uh, herself uh, in, in oral, uh, I, I think we should proceed now to the next strategic area. Uh, anyway, we will have time for uh, questions later on uh, during the period of questions and answers. So moving on, strategic area number two, 
research and development of new biopharmaceuticals and therapeutic solutions, including antimicrobials, vaccines, phage therapies, and microbiome therapeutics for human use. I will give the floor for that to Professor Nelson Lima. Nelson is a full professor at the University of Minho. He is the coordinator of the Applied Mycology Group at the Center of Biological Engineering. He is the director of the Micoteca da Universidade do Minho. He is also coordinator of the Portuguese National Node of MIRI and coordinator of the IS MIRI 21 project. And he is also the acting, an acting member of uh, MIRI's International Coordinator for, for, uh, Forum. Nelson, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm trying to, to share the, my presentation. Let me see if I can. Mm -hmm. It's not working properly today. Uh, well, where is my presentation? Uh, we just saw it for a moment, Nelson. Then we lost he, it. He is, yes, I, today I have some difficulties with my connections. Let me see if I can share. Otherwise, otherwise I ask to uh, Alexander to to share my presentation because I think that today my I have several difficulties to to do this. So uh, let me see. Last attempt, if I can. Mm -hmm. Share screen. Again, okay. Now I think that we, you can see my my full screen. Indeed, uh, Nelson. Okay. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for, to attend this webinar, new year webinars. Today I will speak about uh, uh, the strategic area number two that is re related with the research and development of uh, new biopharmaceutic and biotherapeutic solutions. Uh, of course, I don't go to in details, but only to, to uh, put you on the same page. Uh, we are speaking on the strategic number two that is related with in our uh, strategic research and innovation agenda. Uh, is uh, related with the health and food domain and uh, uh, the alignments or the main alignments uh, on this uh, uh, strategic area is uh, uh, related with the uh, research and development of new pharmaceutical solutions and where we include antimicrobials, vaccines, phage therapy and bacterial uh, therapy uh, and of course, also uh, the new uh, domain uh, related with microbial ther therapeutics and uh, personalized medicines for human use. In this sense, uh, uh, this strategic area is related and interconnect with the sustainable development goal uh, uh, number three, that is uh, good and health and well being. And at uh, European level, with the health clusters and the missions at, at uh, climate resilient Europe, and in the Horizon Europe partnership with health, mainly with the different uh, uh, potentialities years that is related with the EU, Africa, global health, innovative health, and uh, uh, and personalized medicines and one health and uh, uh, antimicrobial resistant uh, problems. Uh, with the S3, we are interconnected uh, with all uh, uh, research infrastructures, mainly uh, related with health and food domain. 
uh, and uh, the, the two previous presentations that uh, uh, relate with Isidore and Baikovic showed clear uh, how MIRI can interact with the other research infrastructures on this domain. Uh, I will uh, sh uh, speak about some some items. I will not cover all uh, that is impossible in 50 minutes, but I, 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 I wish to speak about the probiotics that are microorganisms that may defend the human intestine outbreak against pathogens. And uh, the most common use are, uh, and classic one are lactobacillus, uh, saccharomyces, bisitinum bacterium, and bacillus coagulans. Nevertheless, they, they are involved in what we know quite well from a long time, uh, that are connected with the most common pro probiotic foods, like yogurt, kefir, uh, kombucha, uh, sauerkraut, uh, some cheese, and pickles, uh, miso, and so on. That means that they are an important connection between these uh, microorganisms, beneficial microorganisms, with the, some uh, fermented uh, food that uh, comes from the past, and they are well known. Nevertheless, new uh, generation of probiotics are important and new candidates are, are being explored uh, for new applications and uh, targeted therapies on specific inflammations or other diseases. And uh, in this case, we have uh, some lists here uh, that uh, goes in uh, different directions, like using uh, uh, chromogenic, uh, um, uh, let me see if I can change my pointer, uh, uh, bac bacteroids, uh, uh, lactococcus, or even Clostridium uh, butyricum. Uh, that means that in, in the past, uh, these kind of microorganisms and bacteria were not uh, the, the, the main target for uh, uh, probiotics. This means that these are interconnected with the strategic area uh, number set. This is uh, the rescreening and preserving microbiodiversity, uh, as you see on uh, on this afternoon. So uh, uh, the the collections and the MBRCs have a huge potential in in their holdings to survey and uh, find new applications on this field. Another point is the the prebiotics. It's not related, as you know, directly with the, the microorganism, but it's important because our class, uh, a class of substance and chemicals that play a very important role in the growth and the colonization of uh, uh, beneficial uh, bacteria in the human intestine and that are not non, uh, uh, human non-digestible fibers. That means that only the microbiota uh, are able to ferment and call, uh, that uh, the microbiota that colonize the uh, gastrointestinal system. And uh, I put here several uh, uh, pre prebiotic like the force, uh, the gorse, and so on, that are more and more uh, uh, different uh, potential it is to produce the, these uh, compounds and these chemical fibers that later on help the, the system. But the, at the industrial level, uh, they are an uh, important uh, relationship here with the micro, microorganism because the, even uh, to, the, to produce at the industrial level, we need to, to uh, uh, use microorganisms to convert chemically uh, some substrates to the uh, to the prebiotics and to, to go to the market. And uh, uh, it's important to understand that uh, uh, from the intestinal point of view, we have different uh, microorganisms there that are the only ones that are able to, to digest the force, the fruit uh, oligosaccharides or uh, galacto oligosaccharides, uh, and I put here the classic uh, ones uh, for four lactobacillus casei or lactobacillus paracasei, and for, uh, for gorge, uh, uh, 
saccharides, uh, BHTs on uh, bacterium bread, and lactobacillus acidophilus, because they have the gene cassette and they are able to attack and use these, uh, uh, these compounds. But uh, at the same time, from the industrial point of view, it's important to survey uh, again, uh, the holdings that we have in our collections to uh, to check who is able to produce in better conditions and in uh, cost-effective conditions um, at industrial level, these compounds. And for this, for instance, uh, we have developed some years ago uh, a, a rapid chromogenic test using a, a different combination of detection of glucose and fructose. And when we combine this uh, chromogenic uh, and when we have the microorganisms that are able to produce force, we are, we are able to uh, detect a, a different color. And this uh, different change of the color and uh, give us the uh, a, a transfructose acetylation activity uh, that uh, transforms sucrose in glucose and uh, sucrose also in castose, and uh, that uh, is one uh, start point for producing force. Uh, these activities and this screen allow us uh, on the past to uh, detect uh, uh, on the collection um, the strains that are more prone of to produce and um, uh, transfructose relations that means that can produce different force or less or uh, uh, no no activity at, at all and this uh, it was very important at that time because we list and we make a, a long survey uh, and we detect that on the holdings that we have in uh, a collection, uh, some of them were quite uh, in, important strength to produce at industrial level uh, uh, force. And one of the the, the fungi, uh, the fungus, uh, was a, a Aureobasilis pollinans, and I show you here a, a classic fermentation process. Uh, using uh, from uh, then a feed batch uh, point. I don't go in detail, but uh, later on uh, it was possible to see the sucrose that it was uh, moving and it was consumed, and other uh, uh, compounds uh, like castos, nystos, and other ones, they start appear and they were produced. At the end of the day, with this uh, work, and with this my PhD student at that time, it was possible uh, with uh, a, 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 a spin-off that we have in our university, uh, it was possible to, to organize and to move for industrial process. And this industrial process is now patent. So the long, uh, the long path from the screening and the, the using of the holdings uh, depositing the microbial resource, it was uh, 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 a us to, to move forward and to produce force at the industrial level and uh, patented all the processes. So this means that uh, the combination and the prebiotics uh, has even now room to uh, produce uh, force and the gauze and many other uh, prebiotics, uh, as you know. Uh, the symbiotic is a, a, a mix of uh, living uh, microorganisms that are also uh, important to explore in our holdings. Uh, and MURI is important in this sense to select the utilization of those microorganisms that uh, uh, confer uh, all the, and the benefit for the host. Of course, that we can have the approach of complementarity, that is uh, the combine the prebiotic and probiotic to work independently to elicit one or more health benefits. Uh, these are complementarity. But we have also the possibility to work in, the, in a synergistic way. That means that uh, uh, the substrate that is utilized for co-administrative life uh, 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 go and is uh, select to, to uh, improve uh, the life uh, microorganisms activity and later on as a, a consequence, a matter of consequence should, uh, will uh, give the health benefit. That means that is not directly 
for uh, the substrate is uh, the utilization of microorganisms that uh, later on go to the health benefits and in this uh, way we, we we go to a more synergistic way the nutraceutic is also a big uh, market uh, today and uh, they are medicinal and nutritional functional foods which have also been called medical foods designer foods and um, uh, nutritional supplements and so on. This means that most of the nutritionals uh, comes to, to try to provide the health promotion and at the same time to avoid uh, or uh, reduce uh, uh, some uh, uh, impacts of different diseases in terms of prevention of disease from one side uh, uh the prevention of disease and from the other side of course promoting uh, the health this is a, a a big market moving for the microbiomes nowadays the microbiomes is a, a huge topic and uh, tomorrow we have matt ryan to speak about this uh early uh in the morning i think that is the first speaker so uh if we go to the gut mi microbiome of course that we have different technologies that all combine for the study of the gut micro uh, microbiome and uh, uh sylvan uh, mentioned uh, today the cultural mix that is quite important and of course that all of them uh, are interconnected with the different uh, factors uh, that uh, can contribute for a more personalized uh, medicines and benefits. The microbiome definition is uh, mainly uh, related not, not only with the microbiota that is present in one specific niche, ecologic niche, but uh, combine also the activities of these micro uh, uh, these microorganisms in and the role that they play and the different components of the mi microbial components that they, 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 they play and in the interaction with the, the environmental conditions and the different uh, metabolic uh, activities that they, uh, the microorganisms uh, produce and interact with the, uh, the uh, environment and the niche where they are so uh using these uh, uh and take these uh, in consideration the, the microbiomes uh, uh and uh, can be used also uh and the study uh, show us uh, important uh, uh, outputs like the potentiality of bacterial uh, bacterial therapy uh that is the use of live bacterial therapeutics uh, lbt and what we know uh and you assume that uh, with the industrialization so we have uh, more and more diseases because at the same time the gut of microbiota diversity are declined from the uh, the industrialization and the, uh, the, uh, the the movement of the human population from the rural or from the more wild uh, areas for rural and ur urban so this diversity is a decline and the, at the same time so what we need is to reverse this decline microbiota diversity and uh, expecting that with this recover we can uh, reduce this modern disease. This is the possible future and at the same time the fecal microbiome a microbiota transplantation is a, 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 an attempt to restore uh, the and uh, the uh, and to return to the uh, the uh, ecological balance to the colon and treat uh, some uh, uh, infections like the infections produced by uh, clostridioides difficile this is one pot, uh, possibility and the fecal microbial transplantations is quite important because uh, to to, to as a potential treatment of this uh, infection because in the united states of millions of infections every every year and about 29 uh, andrus uh, deaths and in uh, at the european level we have uh, one and a half uh, uh, thousands infections and about uh, eight thousand deaths per year so that this create a, a pressure 
uh, on the, this uh, health system. But uh, these are. Well, sorry called... to interrupt you. Uh, you have run out of time. Uh, if you okay, uh, I, I stop it here. Uh, so uh, this uh, shows some difficulties today. Uh, we need to, to take a, in consideration that when we use a fecal trans microbial transplantation, they are risk, and this risk needs to be, of course, be treated and be careful uh, study. This is quite important to understand that all these systems uh, need to go to the uh, a better understanding, and the microbiome field is wonderful uh, to uh, go in this direction. And of course, using the cultural mix, uh, uh, creating uh, and define new species uh, that they need to classify and preserve in our collection. And later on, I think that Matt and Ryan tomorrow will uh, speak about microbiome support. So uh, uh, later, and the last one, the bacteriophage is a quite important uh, a, a approach. This means that uh, uh, the, uh, the lysines of uh, 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 that are enzyme uh, proteins from the bacteriophage can be used to make the uh, lytic uh, um, uh, the bacteria and uh, the, they treat the bacteria and the polymerase also they can be used in a, a preclinical trials and they are they are now very promising. Uh, results that uh, the polymerase they uh, can survive the the pig in, in, uh, and the that the that, that the the mouse that the, were not in fact uh, 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 they were in fact without the the polymerase virus the polymerase they die after twenty hours. So, in conclusions, uh, a lot of work uh, is necessary to do, uh, and a lot of important uh, characterization of our holdings is necessary to go on these uh, new therapeutics. And don't forget that the market is uh, increased 9% until 2025 and reach a, a, a huge number of billions of euros. So, thank you uh, for, uh, yeah, for your time. Thank you so much, Nelson, for this very complete presentation. We can now move to the case presentation. Uh, I'll give the floor to Juan Luis Gomez. Uh, Juan Luis is a professor at University of Las Palmas de Gran Canaria. He is also a researcher in algal biotechnology at uh, BEA, the Spanish Bank of Algae. Uh, he will be talking about the current status of microalgae as a source of biological active compounds. Please, Juan Luis, go ahead. The floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can you? Listen to me and see my Love presentation. And Loud and clear. Perfect. Thank you. thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for the invitation to this uh, webinar, which is very interesting. And within the, the strategic area two, we are involved in the development of activity related to microalgae. So I was request to make a short presentation of what is going on about the, uh, the use of microalgae uh, as a source of bio bi biological active compounds. Just a, a, a first introduction where, where we are. We, we are a laboratory from the University of Las Palmas de Gran Canaria, uh, which is uh, placed in, in the marine scientific part of the university in the, in the Taliarte Harbor. And we have been working here for 30 years, uh, developing programs and, and um, uh, work and projects uh, related with the uh, development of uh, algal, algal biotechnology in the Canary Islands. And uh, during these times, we, we, we have been developing different uh, activities. And in the last 20 years, we have been working very hard on the promotion and development of uh, uh, micro, my, microalgae biotechnology in two main fields. Uh, first uh, is the, the uh, biodiversity conservation. As far as in the Canary Island, there was uh, very few work uh, made already in microalgae. And we have been working hard on the bioprospection and all the identification and um, maintenance of uh, cultures. And we are using the, the collection to get new information related with the uh, microalgae. And, and we have developed a program related with the characterization and uh, valorization of the, all, all these kind of uh, 
resources, genetic resources, and mostly related uh, with the uh, study of uh, bioactive compounds uh, with the possibilities for biotechnological application in different uh, fields like agriculture, uh, biomedicals, uh, uh, functional metabolites for food, nutrition and health, or for the cosmetic industry. We, uh, our developments are always uh, associated with the sustainable development goals and, and, uh, and we develop all, all this work related with these fields. Uh, it's important to notice that uh, we can find microalgae in different environments and this is a very interesting point of view to start uh, research related with all these kind of uh, uh, activities and we show uh, we, we, we sampling uh, around the whole Canary Island but also around the Macaronesian uh, uh, region and we like to, to, to find samples uh, just not only in, in the ocean uh, but also in, in continental waters and also we like very much the, the stremophilic uh, environment so our collection is uh, based mostly on all the, uh, in all these kind of uh, samples you can see here some sampling in, in salmores in, in Gran Canaria but also in some uh, volcanic activities uh, 10 years ago in, in the island of El Hierro or some events that we have identified as red tides in Gran Canaria, where we have been also uh, looking for samples to work with. Nowadays, we hold in our collection more than 2,000 uh, unialgal clonal strains from different taxonomical groups, and, and uh, uh, you can uh, understand that most of, of these uh, isolations we, we, uh, we have are a new identification for the uh, environment of the Canary Islands, but also new identification for science. And we try to uh, characterize all these uh, taxonomical uh, uh, samples uh, from different points of view. Uh, and well, you, you, in, in MIRI, we have the, you, you all have the access to uh, the, the data from our uh, microalgae collection, which is very important also in cyanobacteria that we consider also as a group inside the microalgae because we, we grow them uh, uh, in a phototrophic, uh, a photoautotrophic way of, of growing. Um, uh, within the, the strategic lines in MIRI, we are very much involved in the development of all this kind of characterization of this uh, uh, biodiversity and through uh, just not only on the conservation of the, of the genetic resource, but also in the development of uh, cultural activities and, and downstream process that can uh, give us some information about the different strains that we can uh, study. Uh, so far, we, we have a very small pilot plant facility where we can develop different uh, uh, cultivation systems just uh, in the case to, to obtain biomass to go ahead with the characterization of, uh, of this uh, uh, biomass uh, from the different point of view. And we, we, in the last year, we have been focused very much on the uh, identification of bioactives. And, and you can see how we, we can uh, process all these kind of uh, cultures and samples uh, in the different ways, just uh, and methodologies, just looking for all these kind of uh, possibilities and, and characterization of all these kind of uh, strains and, and, and biomass. Uh, within this uh, uh, new recent uh, review by Levasseur uh, in Biotechnology Advanced, uh, is a very nice one. We can see the relationship between the, the taxonomical point of view, uh, the identification of uh, different groups of, of compounds that we can find in microalgae and the possible uh, application as uh, bioactive in, in different uh, fields of uh, not only research, just uh, also in the industrial uh, from the industrial point of view, because we have here biomedical applications, cosmeceuticals, nutritionals, uh, um, and food applications, and we can identify different groups of uh, um, uh, molecules within the pigments, which are very specific in microalgae, uh, the, the polysaccharides, which are also very much related with the previous talk uh, by Professor Lima uh, in relation with the uh, 
uh, use of or, or identification of prebiotics and, and probiotics, uh, proteins, uh, original proteins, esterols, vitamins, polyphenols, or, or polyunsaturated uh, unsaturated fatty acids we, uh, uh, related with uh, application, for example, in aquaculture. Uh, when we make the prospection in our in, in our collection, it's very interesting to notice uh, uh, if we go ahead, uh, if we go through the, the literature, we can find um, an increased number of articles related with the identification of bioactives in, in uh, microalgae, but particularly the goal is that uh, cyanophysia, it, it must say is uh, cyanobacteria, are the main group of uh, mm, uh, microalgae or, or in this case uh, prokaryotic, prokaryotic photosynthetic uh, organisms that are most recognized as a source of bioactive in the literature so there is an increasing field of interest related with the other taxonomical groups that are also very interesting uh, uh, going again to the review, uh, we can see here a list of uh, um, the molecules uh, within the different uh, metabolites groups that uh, are identified as uh, very interesting molecules for the uh, application of different industries. But if you can see here, you, you can see how the important uh, possibilities for this kind of compounds in the pharmaceuticals and uh, nutraceuticals and this kind of uh, uh, use of bioactives in the in the industrial. Uh, there is uh, well, I, I have pointed out uh, different groups of molecules that uh, we are studying uh, in in our uh, collection of uh, microalgae, uh, which are mostly related with. Uh, lipids and poly, polyunsaturated fatty acid, carotenoids or phycobiliproteins that has uh, a very interesting possibilities for applications. Uh, uh, the, the, the amount of molecules and the, the uh, possibilities with the, these different groups of organisms is very high. And we can see here also the, the use of polysaccharides and particularly exopolysaccharides proteins, including uh, new polypeptides uh, or, for example, amino acids uh, that uh, used to be uh, used for photoprotection in the cells, or, for example, the fields of the polyphenols, which, which I think is very interesting and is very much related with the uh, synthesis of this kind of uh, uh, molecules in, in, in microalgae. Uh, well, you can see in the slide that uh, I'm illustrating some of the experiments we made in the laboratory, just trying to identify uh, all the possibilities for these kind of molecules in the cultures we develop in the lab. Here you have some of the examples that uh, we have been working in the last years. Uh, uh, for example, into, in, in the identification of uh, extracellular polymeric substance uh, with possibilities for um, uh, be, uh, as bioactive uh, using microalgae, uh, uh, in this case, an extremophilic microalgae, uh, which is uh, able to grow at very high temperatures, or uh, the, the use of cyanobacteria and also rhodophytes for the identification of antioxidants and, and UV radiation absorbing compounds with the possibilities to identify them and to use in the cos cosmeceuticals application. And the same, uh, the, the, we, we are trying to characterize all this kind of uh, 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 biodiversity, uh, uh, trying to identify profiles and, and activities related with the uh, bioactive uh, possibilities. Uh, just to finish this short presentation, I would like to, to uh, point out the interest that uh, um, the, the use of microalgae can also have for uh, application like as bioremediation process or, or in, in process related with the uh, mitigation of uh, global change. We have been involved in the Savannah project where we have been using um, uh, wastewaters uh, 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 for the culture of microalgae. We have made a selection 
uh, of uh, different strains that can be useful for this kind of processing uh, and process for the bioremediation activities, but also that can have uh, uh, positive and, and they can have uh, many possibilities for the development of biostimulants and biopesticides in the, in the uh, agriculture application. Uh, this is a very interesting field of uh, action and it's very much related with these kind of molecules that uh, show uh, some kind of uh, bi bioactivities. Uh, we have been studying the relation between the, the algae we grow in the wastewaters with the uh, identification of uh, hormone -like, hormones like like axins, hydrokinins and gibberellins uh, obtained from the different cultures we have been growing uh, uh, in the wastewaters in the bioremediation process. And I think that's all. Uh, it's very fast, but uh, you can have an idea of what, what we, we are uh, doing in our laboratory and well, questions are uh, welcome and we can, uh, you can contact us for any inform additional information. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Juan Luis, uh, for this very clear presentation. And still, we are on time. So we have a couple of minutes uh, available uh, for a very quick question, if there are any. Francisco? Yes, we do have a question from Sylvain. And uh, Sylvain is one of the speakers. Maybe I would invite him to pose the question orally, if that's fine. OK, do you hear me? Yeah, yes, perfect. Good. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's it's perhaps more for for Nelson, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering about the perspectives for development of uh, bacteriophage uh, sub collections within Miri, and whether we should do that together because there are many challenges, including those that are linked to, you know, clinical usage or food usage of bacteriophages. So, I don't know. Maybe that's something we should discuss at some point uh, together before any of us embark in this kind of things. If. Yes, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the the key message at at this uh, at, at this moment that they are a, a potential uh, use of uh, different uh, bac bacteria or microorganisms. In fact, not only bacteri bacterial uh, and also uh, bacterial therapy. Uh, the most important point are uh, related to the. Uh, uh, important uh, uh, and uh, 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 complete as much as possible a complete characterization of these uh, biological materials. Uh, when I point out um, the, the the use of uh, the fecal uh, trans, uh, transplantation and the deaths resulting in this, it was a, a miss. Uh, a problem that uh, the, the characterization and the, the completely study of the, the material that the, it was used for treatment, it was not completed. So the, the same for a bacterial phage. Uh, it's quite important nowadays to have a, 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 a more completely and not start to use on the, uh, uh, only with a, a, a partial characterization or a, a weak characterization even when the results are promising because later on we i think that uh, uh, the problems can uh, can appear and in this sense the the collections uh, they have expertise the mbrts they have expertise to make the the, the full characterization uh, uh, using the state of the art uh, the correct state of the art okay thanks Francisco, Thank you. back to you. I think there's another question. Yes, yes, we do have one question from Anna Lazica. Um, and this question is actually to Juan Luis. So, Juan, the question is, do you provide free access to your collections or there are some restrictions? No, no. Uh, the, our collection is already open and, and we give access. You can uh, go through our web page and look for uh, the strains you are interested in and you can contact us and, and we provide this kind of strains. Yeah, I can add to that, if I may, that Miri is right now working on the new catalog to launch earlier next year. So we, we will be considering all the requests that have been arriving to us uh, for specific resources or services 
So it is a possibility for us to include in the next TNA catalog this possibility. So just to, to make a yes. quick uh, overview about that, uh, researchers and uh, companies can apply for our transnational access in the upcoming mm -hmm. call. We will be providing free access to our resources, facilities and services uh, mm -hmm. uh, within a certain group of selected ones. Uh, so it's it's very nice to hear from you, the, the potential users, uh, uh, which kind of resources and facilities will be interested in accessing to so we can uh, include those in our next catalog. So thank you for that. Well, I believe we can now proceed uh, to the next point on the agenda. Uh, it's time to talk about money, if I may. So the, the funding opportunities we will have in the work program under the Cluster Elf on Horizon Europe. Uh, for that purpose, uh, we have uh, with us uh, Dr. Virginie Sivin. Um, Virginie Sivin is the national contact point for Horizon Europe uh, on health teams. Uh, she works at the Ministry of Higher Education, Research and Innovation. Uh, she has kindly accepted to explain to us uh, in about uh, 30 minutes, as much as possible, um, uh, which kind of opportunities will be available for collaboration uh, under the cluster ELF. So, Virginie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so, I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay, hope it's okay. Um, so um, I'm uh, I'm Virginie Sivan. I'm working at the Ministry of Higher Education, Research and Innovation in in France. Um, just to uh, to present the, the team I'm working with. Um, I am a national contact point for health in France, and uh, we are a team of uh, four people. Uh, and the, 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 the aim of this team is really to uh, encourage uh, the, the community to participate to the, to the calls uh, on, uh, on health. Um, so this is why I'm, I'm going to try to do uh, today for uh, all of all of you um, just um, to uh, remind you uh, what is uh, uh, Horizon Europe so briefly uh, this is the, the the most ambitious research and innovation funding program uh, of uh, of Europe, uh, it's a seven years program with a very ambitious uh, budget, uh, almost uh, one hundred billion euros for these seven years. Um, it's um, compared to Horizon twenty twenty, the previous program. It's more an evolution. It's not a revolution as uh, uh, you can see that uh, um, in terms of structures and uh, participation rules uh, it's quite uh, the same but there are some key novelties uh, in particular uh, the uh, Europe Innovation Council uh, which is a program focused on innovation uh, there is a, a new uh, instrument also, uh, which are the missions, uh, which has a portfolio of projects with uh, ambitious and measurable objectives. Um, there is a new approach on partnership, and we will talk about that uh, for else. Uh, another point important is the open science uh, policy um, with the real will to, to promote uh, citizen engagement. Um, and there is um, a will from the Commission to a stranger uh, international co uh, cooperation too. So uh, you can see here um, the, the, the organization of uh, this program. So it's uh, organized in three uh, pillars. The first one is uh, a pillar uh, dedicated to excellence. Uh, the second one is um, is uh, covers all the the, the global challenge to the, the the big challenges um, which are named clusters in the Eurasian Europe and the third one is uh, for um, innovation uh, so you can see that uh, uh, 
else is mainly uh, covered through a program in uh, in the pillar two, the the program uh, else. But you can also find uh, some uh, um, health topics uh, within the pillar one in the ERC, for example, but also uh, in the um, the mobility program Maria Slodowska Curie, uh, and also, of course, uh, in the program research infrastructures. But today we are going to focus on the program uh, in ELSE and I also will uh, say um, a word on the, uh, the program, the Innovation, uh, European Innovation Council. So if we uh, go um, through the, the, the cluster ELSE, so uh, you can see that uh, several areas uh, have been uh, prioritized for this uh, cluster for the seven years but in order to uh, to guide and uh, to facilitate the implementation of uh, this program we have a strategic uh, strategic planification uh, which covers the first four years of um, of two rights in Europe and based on this uh, strategic uh, plan um, we have a work program which is a B uh, annual work program uh, which contains all the call for proposals so um, so today we uh, this uh, work program is published but within the cluster health you also have uh, else partnerships which are also very important and that will launch uh, calls for proposals uh, during uh, the world duration of uh, Eurasian Europe and uh, um, uh, last but not least the cancer mission has also a work program a dedicated uh, work program I will not develop that uh, in that presentation but I will uh, focus on the work program on health and uh, on the health partnerships today so um, what uh, what can we find in the work program and how can we uh, how can you participate in this uh, work program so first of all in this work program you will have this work program is going to fund collaborative projects so different actions can be uh, funded uh, research and innovation action which are the main action funded uh, within this program but you also have some innovation action um, which are more uh, the development of prototype of pilot for example you also uh, have coordinated and support actions so these actions are not research action but th they are uh, proposed to um, uh, to structure a community or to prepare a future call and you also have some uh, action to support the innovation in public procurement which are the pre-commercial procurement and the public procurement of innovation so uh, to be eligible to uh, to apply to uh, a, a project uh, in this cluster you will need to have a consortium of a minimum of three independent legal entities uh, established in three different member or associated states and at least one of these legal entities should be established it's one of uh, the uh, 27 uh, EU member states everybody can participate as soon as uh, you have a, a legal entity so any or any legal entity from uh, any country can participate so it can be universities, research organizations, associations, companies, etc. So, of course, I put uh, infrastructures. I wanted to um, to say that in the introduction of the work program, it is stated that applicants to calls uh, of health cluster are encouraged to consider when relevant the services offered by the current and future EU-funded European infrastructures so just to say that uh, the infrastructures are very important in this uh, research project so uh, everybody can participate but who can be funded it's only uh, member states and also uh, associated countries to Eurasian Europe but uh, also low and middle income countries can uh, can be funded 
and you have um, if through this link you have all the countries that can be funded uh, through this uh, this uh, cluster else and um, a specificity of the cluster else is that uh, partners American partners can also participate and be funded uh, in this cluster. Uh, it's a rule of reciprocity uh, with the NIH funding because uh, European partners uh, can also be funded through this uh, program NIH. And uh, in terms of in in, uh, in term of funding rates, uh, you are going to be funded uh, one hundred percent of the diode cost for each project. So, um, uh, in terms of um, budget, so first of all, the work program is uh, accessible to uh, through this link. Um, all the topics, the 21 uh, topics uh, are closed today, but you have um, still 22 topics uh, in uh, 2022 uh, that are still open. You have here the, the deadlines. So you have two types of uh, calls for proposals, uh, calls in a single stage. So the deadline is 21 April uh, 2020. And you have also two stages proposals and the first deadline um, is the 1st February 2022. So here you have the link uh, to access the uh, EC funding and tenders website where all the uh, calls for proposals are published. In terms of, um, of uh, um, topics, uh, the cluster, uh, the, the work program is um, organized in three, in, in six destinations. Uh, these destinations uh, are the uh, impact expected by the, the, the Commission. So um, I listed uh, all the th six destinations, but what we, uh, is going to be interesting for you is to have the list of the topics uh, under all these uh, destinations. So for each uh, of these destinations, um, I will give you the, the topics, uh, I highlighted some of the topics uh, that uh, I, I considered relevant for the, the MIRI infrastructures, but of course, uh, this is um, my, pers my, prospect, uh, my perspective. Um, so for the destination one, staying healthy in a rapidly and changing society, uh, you have four topics open. So on this table, you can see the deadline of the first stage, the deadline of the second stage, the type of action that is going to fund it, the budget per project, and the total budget for the line. So you can um, anticipate the number of projects that are going to be funded um, per, per line. So um, here you have uh, some uh, topics. So only research and innovation action. You have topics on mental health, on uh, artificial intelligence tools, uh, on prevention of obesity and on chronic inflammation. For the destination two, living and working in a health promoting environment, you have one topic on uh, health related costs to environmental stressors. For the destination three, uh, tackling diseases and reducing uh, disease burden. So here you, uh, you have five topics and I highlighted three, three of them. So uh, the first one is uh, preclinical development of the next generation immunotherapies for disease or disorders with unmet medical needs. Um, so uh, for this uh, topic, uh, so the aim of this topic is really the preclinical development and, and study um, of, uh, of new immunotherapy uh, 
peers the rapid uh, agents and it goes from um, uh, from uh, from in vitro to uh, proof of concept and first in human studies uh, you also see that there is um, a topic uh, on uh, vaccines. Uh, so really the aim is to uh, develop the next generation uh, of vaccines um, in, in order to, to achieve um, a vaccine development pipeline against, against infectious diseases. You have um, so also the uh, topic on therapy uh, for rare diseases, but I highlighted the topics on pandemic preparedness. Um, because uh, uh, um, the, the really the, the aim of this topic is to develop research on emerging pathogens, identify uh, identification of potential medical countermeasures and innovative technologies. So this could be uh, relevant for for Miri as well. And the last one is um, is more on non -com communicable diseases. For the destination four, uh, ensuring access to innovative, sustainable, and uh, high quality uh, health care. Um, I'm not going to go into detail. This uh, destination is more um, related to public health actions, but of course, you will have these slides. The destination five is um, to unlock the full potential of new tools, technologies, and digital solutions for healthy society. So I, light, I highlighted um, one, uh, one topic. It's uh, optimizing effectiveness in patients uh, of existing prescription prescription drugs for major diseases with the use of uh, biomarkers. Um, so this, uh, this uh, call could uh, uh, be uh, relevant for Miria as well. Uh, you also have uh, some, um, uh, some topics on uh, uh, real world data and synthetic data as well, and computational models for new patient stratification strategies. And the last destination is maintaining an innovative, sustainable, and globally competitive health-related industry. Uh, and in this uh, destination, you have uh, topics on cybersecurity, uh, on uh, data anonymization techniques, on uh, uh, payment models, uh, for example. Um, so, uh, just before uh, going to the, the partnership, uh, I wanted just to, um, uh, to highlight that for this type, for, for the, the project, the, the, all these topics um, are going to fund projects with different uh, budget. You can see that the budget per project can uh, range from Three, uh, three millions to 15 million euros, and which is very de de dependent uh, on, the, on the topic. So I, I, I wanted also to, um, to say a few words on uh, health partnerships, which are very important also in the, in the, cluster, in the cluster health. So um, the partnerships are uh, initiative where there is a collaboration between the European Commission and the member states or the European Commission and the industry. And uh, really the aim is to support uh, together research and innovation. So these, all these partnerships are individual uh, instruments that are so focused on a specific uh, thematic and that are going to launch um, call for proposals 
in an independent uh, manner. So uh, the the agenda will not follow the agenda of the of the global war program of the cluster else. Um, so you can see that uh, in the cluster health, you have uh, nine uh, partnerships, so it's a lot, and uh, many of them can uh, be uh, relevant for, for MIRI. Uh, the two first ones are the Innovative Health Initiative and the EU Africa Global Health Partnership. So just some more detail on this slide. So. Innovative Health uh, Initiative uh, is the follow-up of the uh, previous partnership, which was the uh, Innovative Medicine Initiative. So it's a partnership between uh, the European Commission and uh, industry. So uh, different um, industry association, uh, pharmaceutical companies, but also med tech companies. The scope of this partnership is to accelerate the development uh, of safer and more effective healthcare interventions that respond to unmet uh, public health needs. So you have the link to the, uh, the, the strategic research agenda of uh, this partnership. Um, and the first calls should be launched uh, at the end of this year or just the beginning of, uh, of uh, next year. So it's important that to have that uh, in mind. The second uh, partnership is uh, the EU Africa Global Health Partnership. It's a partnership between the European Commission um, and uh, uh, the, the, the member states and the African states. Um, and uh, really uh, the, the objective of this partnership is to promote the development and update of new or improved intervention by supporting the conduct of clinical trials in sub-Saharan -Sub Africa and also to strengthen uh, research and innovation capacities. So it's the follow-up of, of a program that was already existed uh, in Eurasian 2020. And the first calls are going to be published beginning of uh, 2022. So apart uh, from these uh, two first partnerships that uh, are going to be launched very soon. There are also um, a number of uh, other uh, co-funded uh, partnerships with uh, specific topics that are going to be launched from 2022 to 2024. So you just uh, need to have in mind that this partnership, the, the, the topics of this partnership, and as soon as uh, they will be launched, they, uh, they are going to uh, publish uh, some calls for proposals. So you will uh, see that we'll have a, a partnership um, that would be focused on different topics, nanomedicine, cardiovascular disease, healthy diet and healthy lives, and international clinical trials. Uh, another one on pandemic preparedness partnership, which uh, would be very relevant for MIRI. Another one on personalized medicine, and another one on um, one else antimicrobial resistance. So that's all for the partnerships. Uh, I just wanted also to give you some information on the European Innovation Council. Um, which is um, a, a, a program that um, is covering all innovation stages uh, of the development of uh, breakthrough uh, technologies. So uh, what is important to remember for this um, uh, program is it is uh, organized in three different programs, the Pathfinder, uh, for advanced research on emerging technologies, the transition program from lab to commercial uh, settings, and the accelerator. So these two programs are going to fund collaborative projects. And the, the last program, the accelerator, uh, is going to fund 
um, uh, uh, startups and SMEs. So its uh, accelerator is not going to fund um, to fund collaborative project. So uh, I go through very rapidly uh, the different uh, program, the uh, Pathfinder that is going to fund uh, mainly uh, so, so you will have a, a bottom-up program, but also a thematic programs where you are going to find else topics. Uh, so you see that the, the 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 size of the the project are smaller than the 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 the, the project funded uh, uh, through the the cluster else. So it's uh, about three to four millions of budget um, this the second program is the eic transitions so really it's to bridge the gap between research phase and innovation application so uh, here you also have a bottom-up program and um, uh, a more focused um, uh, um, most fo focus on, on topic program too and the last program is the AIC Accelerator. So here it's uh, really uh, in, for individual companies. So here we are not talking about um, collaborative projects. So here you have all that uh, has been funded in, in 2021. All these call, uh, these call for proposals are now closed, but you can see that for the Pathfinder, for example, you you had uh, some topics uh, on uh, else, for example, cell and gene therapies, and the same for transition and the same for accelerator. So what is important to remember is this, uh, the new work program uh, 2022 is under preparation and, and will be published in December. Some uh, message to take home because I gave you a lot of information. But what is important to remember is the uh, are the deadlines. So for the work program, else for the cluster, else the deadlines are um, uh, presented here. Uh, I I put you also a link a link to uh, the info day. Uh, cluster else that uh, was organized uh, end of October and you have all the recordings uh, through the links. Uh, important to uh, remember is that the work program uh, for the cancer mission is going to be published at the end of uh, 2021. The same for the EIC program and for the partnership two uh, partnerships uh, are going to be launched uh, in 2021 and the other one will be uh, launched from 2021 to 2024. Uh, here you have also the link to the EC Funding and Tenders website where you can find all the call for proposals and, um, and the link to the Eurasian Europe French website and uh, the contact detail if you want to contact the French uh, national contact points to have more information on uh, all these uh, these topics do not hesitate to contact us thank you very much thank you so much Virginie for this very complete and informative presentation uh, we, we are on time, actually, so we have uh, at least 10 minutes for a Q&A. So I give the floor back to you, Francisco. Do we have questions? Yes, we do, Luis. One to the overall panel. Uh, one from Mizu, and I will read the question. Do you consider worthy bioprospecting for antibiotic discovery from European habits? I don't know, Luis, if uh, someone can answer this. Nelson, Silva, are you online? Can you try to answer the question, please? You want me to answer? Please go ahead, Silva. Yeah, I think, I think generally speaking, bioprospection is always worthy. Um, 
but it's also highly, highly risky. Um, so as long as you have very original uh, habitats or ecosystems to, to screen, um, it can be worse going and give it a try. Keeping in mind that it's a very risky enterprise. Yes. Uh, for, for my side, I, I fully agree that the bio, bio prospect is uh, remain a, a, a quite important topic. Nevertheless, in the last uh, decade or more, uh, what we saw that uh, when we integrate bio prospecting in the national or uh, international or European uh, uh, project to be funded, uh, normally the funding agencies not uh, appreciate too much the to fund these activities uh, even when we go to the very extreme uh, environments uh, why uh, because uh, from one side uh, we have uh, in our muri holding so, so many strengths that they need to be explored yet and uh, they were not completely full explored so we, we need to continue to make bio prospecting but um, i think that we need to justify and to integrate the bio prospecting in a very uh, clever and precise way uh, to justify why we need to make more bio prospecting and not to use uh, directly the holdings that we have yet available in the culture collection this is a, a long discussion on the past and the uh, funding agencies also they have this uh, approach in the in the last years that uh, not not funding a, a, a single project uh, based on bio prospecting so we need to, to be careful in this sense yeah thank you Sylvain nelson i believe this is also a question that can be considered under strategic area seven so i would ask gerard if he's already online if you want to share his view about this as well. Okay, I see Gerard is getting ready. Perhaps it's not easy to do it. Answer for short time. Next time, perhaps we should provide some background music for these moments, for these waiting moments. Okay. Can I ask a question? Sure. Go ahead, please. It will be a question for Virginie. Um, hello, Virginie, and thank you very much for your presentation, which was very complete. I'm, I'm just wondering, just to connect your, your presentation with the, the day, uh, the topic of the day. If regarding, for example, the African initiative, or I don't know exactly the, the, the term, would it be possible to fund um, the creation creation of novel um, biological resource centers in Africa, for example? I'm thinking of the Pasteur Network or other partners. Actually, um, this will uh, depend uh, on the, the, the under this partnership. There is no um, the, the the calls are not bottom up, but they are. Um, there is uh, also there is all, all the time topics. Uh, then uh, funding. So so you mean funding. Uh, um, uh, this type of structures through uh, collaborative project or f through collaborative project yeah i think it would be yeah it would be possible yeah. of course yeah 
any support to biobanking in in African countries, for example, where we can provide expertise, we can exchange uh, materials, obviously, and uh, things like that. So yeah, I was I think also thinking perhaps of more infrastructure funding, but that's, that's probably difficult. I don't know. No, but uh, I think that this can be... Um, uh, this could be possible because in this partnership, um, really the objective is to um, to fund capacity building. So in this context, I think uh, it would be, uh, yeah, it can be it can be possible uh, if the of course if there is a call uh, de dedicated to that. But yes, yeah, it could be, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Merci. <laughs> I uh, managed to get into the meet to uh, to connect to the uh, chat room or how do you call it here the the, the group. Um, but I first had to do some kind of test or something. There was no option to skip it, so it took time. I'm sorry about that. Um, should I uh, respond on the prior prospecting uh, issue? I, I I personally I think that. Um, both are needed. I mean, uh, when we are looking at what we have as holdings in Europe at the moment, it's already very impressive, of course. But um, we know also that there are very many environments in Europe where we know very little about the biodiversity. So I think that if you would do bioprospecting by sampling in such uh, pristine and uh, or uh, threatened uh, environments, you would the the the, the, the knife would cut uh, more than one side. You would on the one time uh, maybe uh, find more interesting uh, candidates for certain uh, biological activities, and on the other hand, you would uh, enrich uh, the uh, basis we have already uh, of uh, biodiversity preserved ex situ. So I think it's rather short-sighted from the viewpoint of us as Miri and Culture Collections to say we have to go for the you know new environments and the exploration, or we have to go for um, uh, only uh, you know exploring what is already in our collections. I think we need to do both, and I think we also need to find ways as an infrastructure to organize that we can do both, even though for both the chances of getting external funding is not as good. There may be partners that are interested uh, other than uh, these, uh, the possibility of funding it through uh, EU funds uh, to, to get uh, to, to explore novel, uh, novel environments and to do bioprospection uh, in the classic sense. That's my opinion. Thank you very much, Gera, for, for, for your view, for sharing your view. Francisco, do we have any other question? We don't. We have a comment from Nelson. Nelson, I don't know if you want to add anything else to this. I saw that you comment on the chat. Uh, yes, uh, it's related to the, the, the first questions of Sylvan because, uh, in fact, I have some difficulties to, to understand of uh, because of the connections. But uh, related to the, the, the bacterial phage collections, in fact, we have in our uh, Within Muri and even outside of Muri, we have several uh, bacteriophage collections, and now uh, more and more some uh, companies that are also try to explore bacteriophage uh, uh, ter uh, uh, ter uh, therapy. And the the, the point here, uh, I think that uh, as uh, what I said before, that uh, a full characterization is needed. We need also to, to be uh, taking account and maybe MURI could work together also for uh, regulatory issues. And uh, uh, this is something that uh, maybe is a, a cross-cutting uh, topic, uh, not only for the bacterial uh, therapy, but in, in many other uh, activities that we have. Maybe we need to uh, approach uh, regulatory agencies uh, and to be more proactive or became stakeholders on these uh, on in these issues uh, and not only to to influence positively the 
the or, but also even fill some gaps that uh, uh, we face on the on this uh, on this topic so i think that uh, miri has also room to work on the regulatory issues and uh, on this topic so it's only to add uh, this information that i think that is quite important for us as uh, uh, as miri uh, as a, a rule and uh, as a research infrastructure okay thank you so much uh, i don't know if there are any other comments from your side otherwise it's lunch time uh, so, Luis, just before finishing, sorry, we sorry. have one more question from okay. Claire here. Maybe we have one minute to answer this. The question is, what about the interest to look at extreme environments like Antarctic based on a collaborative way? Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to comment. I see Nelson nodding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, hi, Claire uh, I, I think that Claire uh, uh, try to 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 show us that there are some uh, extreme environments that uh, uh, we can uh, uh, at the European level uh, sometimes it's not so easy to to go there but uh, in a collaborative way like uh, using a uh, Chile and the, the uh, Antarctic station uh, Chilean station we can uh, work together so uh, in fact it's quite important uh, this uh, to, to have these connections with uh, other uh, extreme environment uh, networks that they are working, for instance, in, in Chile. Uh, I'm speaking about Nexer. Maybe uh, Claudia knows uh, uh, is, uh, know well this network because it's not only uh, uh, speaking about uh, uh, Antarctic, but it's also the Atacama desert, uh, desert and many other uh, extreme environments that we we can face and we can work together and uh, with the collaborative work is uh, is to to have the the possibility to 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 go there or to collaborate with the uh, the the colleagues that they have access uh, or is access to these uh, uh, these uh, uh, sites that are quite important uh, uh, for the to, to make bioprospecting again uh, the, the the possibility to 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 go to the unusual uh, uh, environments and the ecological niches. So I think that the collaborative work is quite important in this sense. Juan, I see that you raised your hand. Yes, yes, just just only one comment. There there, there is. A... Uh, well, many opportunities and many possibilities. Just yes, not only uh, to the to the North Pole or the Antarctic, uh, but remember that uh, there are some very important projects in the last years. For example, accessing to uh, samples in the deeper ocean. Uh, yeah. Just the the Malaspina project was a, a very important project go, going around the whole ocean, getting microbial resources and re, uh, uh, microbial samples that are already keep uh, uh, in different laboratories around the world. But it was a very, very important project. And uh, there is a lot of information coming from this sampling and the, the possibilities of, the, of the new, these new uh, genetic resources. So possibilities are yet important and and we we should uh, have the possibility to join all these kind of projects and and uh, make uh, miri uh, you know uh, to obtain uh, these kind of samples and and possibilities that's it very good okay thank you uh, francisco any other question or comment not a question, but a comment that I will read from Lucille, just mentioning that in September, the NIH, which is the National Institute of Health of the United States, organized a workshop with the Food and Drugs Administration on the topic of bacteriophages. So this can be an idea actually for Europe to network and propose such an event. So this is a very good comment from Lucille. Thank you. Very well, point taken. It's a very good suggestion indeed. So if we don't have any further questions or comments, 
I suggest we move on to lunch. Uh, we will try to come back in about two hours, so at 2 p.m. CET. Thank you so much for having joined us this morning. I think it was very interesting discussion, and we will proceed on that uh, in the afternoon. Thank you so much, and see you in about two hours.